This is EE300, Linear Circuit Analysis 2, Module 3, Video 4, Resonant Circuits. We want to review previous uh, uh, material, then we want to look at the first order circuit again, but we want to take a different perspective looking at some of the branch currents and voltages. Then we're going to do the RLC circuit, the series RLC circuit, and explore concepts of bandwidth and quality factor and resonance, and then we'll have a summary and a preview of coming attractions. So to review a little bit, we've had the sinusoidal steady state, and for circuits with a transfer function H of S, uh, which is the output voltage over the input voltage, when the input voltage is a cosine of frequency omega, the output voltage is a cosine of the same frequency where the gain has been increased by a multiplicative factor of magnitude H of J omega, and the phase angle has been increased by an additive factor angle H of J omega. We call the magnitude, we, we, we can write H of J omega in its complex form as magnitude H of J omega e to the J angle H of J omega, we call the magnitude the frequency response magnitude. We call it the frequency response gain, or just the gain. And then we can do that in decibels, which is 20 to log base 10 magnitude h of j omega. The frequency response angle uh, is just called the angle, or the phase angle, or the phase. And we also saw Bode plots, which is a plot uh, where the gain is in decibels, and the angle's in degrees, and you plot these against frequency on a log scale. Uh, we also saw some frequency selective circuits that had shelving. So, uh, well, frequency se selective circuits uh, uh, had pass bands and stop bands. They allowed the sinusoids of certain frequencies to pass through and, and attenuated others. We had the low pass circuit, we had the high pass circuit. And these were all with first order, just with the RC circuit, really. Uh, and then we had, uh, we define, we can define a pass band as the range of frequencies where the gain is. Uh, more than 3D, uh, within 3 dB of the DC or the high frequency point. So the attenuation is less than minus 3 dB. And then the stop band was those where the attenuation is more than minus 3 dB. And that cutoff 3 dB point is arbitrary. And we call that the frequency where the, was, the gain was 3 dB down, or uh, 1 over root 2 down in ordinary terms. Uh, uh, we call that the corner frequency of the first order circuit. We also had frequency shaping circuits where you had shelves where uh, one end or the other, the high frequency end or the low frequency end, was attenuated relative to the other end, and uh, but the gain was flat within those bands. So this is what the high path, the low pass circuit uh, frequency response looked like as a Bode plot. We have the pass band area here where the gain is more than minus three dB, and here with the corner frequency of, of this is normalized by a, a, where alpha would be one over RC. Uh, and then it rolls off at 20 dB per decade. The gain gets smaller and smaller, and that's because the ordinary frequency response is proportional to 1 over alpha there, 1 over omega there. The phase angle of the low-pass circuit starts with a, a low frequency angle of 0 degrees, where the output's in phase with the input, <clears throat> and ends up with a, a high frequency angle of minus 90 degrees, where the output lags the input by 90 degrees. But it's also getting small here, you can see. The high pass circuit ramped up. Uh, we saw the ordinary response, it starts at zero, so that would be way off at minus infinity here. But in the stop band, <clears throat> the gain is increasing with increasing frequency at a rate of 20 dB per decade. At the corner frequency of al omega equals alpha, it's got a gain of minus 3 dB, so it's down by a factor of one over root two, and then it goes to a gain of one in high frequencies. We see again, at high frequencies now in the, in the pass band, the gain, the output is in phase, and at low frequency, the output actually leads the uh, uh, input, but the output is small. So let's go back and look at this RC circuit again, but from the perspective of what's going on with the currents and, the, and then uh, and the voltages in the individual branches. So there's our RC circuit. We've seen it, I don't know how many times in this class already, but we're going to look particularly at both the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor. And let's start this time with a current source instead of a voltage source over on the, on the input side. So we're driving this thing with a current source of, of frequency omega, various frequencies, and the impedance of the, the input impedance uh, is R plus 1 over SC. It's just the impedance of the resistor in series with the capacitor. So the resistor voltage will then be the impedance of the resistor, the magnitude of the impedance of the resistor, uh, times uh, I, the amplitude of the input current, times cosine omega t, uh, and then the angle is going to be increased by the angle of the uh, uh, resistor impedance. Of course, the resistor impedance is just Z of sub R equals R. So the output is just in phase with the signal at all points. And it's just going to be R times I uh, 
whatever the input current is. So if the current has an amplitude I, the output has an amplitude R times, the output voltage across the resistor has an amplitude R times I, uh, and it's just going to have the same frequency because it's a cosine in, cosine out. It's just you're driving the current, forcing the current to be that, that cosine current uh, waveform there. The capacitor, you do the same thinking in terms of magnitude and phase there, but the capacitor has an impedance, which is 1 over SC, and so at frequency omega, uh, sinusoidal input omega, that's going to be 1 over J omega C. So 1 over J is minus J, so that's an angle of 90, minus 90 degrees. So the amplitude there uh, for low frequencies will be big, because 1 over omega C will be big. Omega small, 1 over omega C will be big, and it's going to have a phase shift of 90 degrees uh, relative to the input, and it's going to be lagging by 90 degrees. You add those up, you ought to get the voltage over here at the input terminal. So that's VR plus VC. And so you're adding RI cos R times I times cos omega T times 1 over omega C times I cos omega T minus 90 degrees. And you do some trig of cos this plus cos that. And you can say that you can write that as a magnitude term R squared plus 1 over omega C squared, uh, square root of all that times I, the input current amplitude, cosine omega T, and then the phase angle of the sum will be minus inverse tangent of omega RC. That's omega um, over alpha, if, if you want, want to think of it that way. And that's just the magnitude of Z of J omega, R plus 1 over J omega C, times I times the cosine of omega T plus the angle of Z of J omega. So, I mean, it has to be. These two volts, this is what the, the impedance is is the voltage you're going to see over here at the input terminal. And so it has to add up when you do it individually. It still has to come back to the same impedance. Uh, let's think a little bit there. As the input current got higher and higher frequencies, um, the voltage across the resistor would stay constant, but the voltage across capacitor would get smaller and smaller. Or looking at it a different way, proportionally more of the voltage shows up across the resistor. It's, it's, the voltage over here is changing also. So as the current gets bigger, the voltage over here, as the as frequency gets bigger, the voltage at the input terminal gets smaller too. But proportionally more of that is across the resistor and less of that is across capacitor as you increase frequency. So it ought to have that same behavior when we have a voltage source over here, except now we're fixing the voltage between those terminals and letting the current change as the frequency changes. So let's go to that problem. Here's the, the same circuit now driven by the voltage source. And now the current, we would normally think about the admit, we would we do hardly ever, I shouldn't say we normally, but you can think about the admittance here to generate the current from the voltage. So the, the current in the frequency domain, in the J omega domain, you would have the current I of T, the sinusoidal steady state current would be one over the magnitude of the impedance because that's the magnitude of the admittance times the input amplitude V times the cosine uh, uh, at frequency omega t, now its phase angle would be increased by be plus angle y of j omega, which is the same as minus angle of z of j omega, because y and z are arithmetic inverses of each other. So here's our impedance again, our, and we just think in terms of impedances more than we do in terms of admittances. Uh, we, so when we do uh, in terms of the frequency omega, we have z of j omega is r, and it's plus 1 over j omega c, and 1 over j is minus j, so we can write it as r minus j, omega, j over omega c. And we notice there that when omega is 1 over rc, we plug in 1 over rc for omega in the expression for the impedance there, that's going to give us r minus j r. That means that the size of the uh, real part and the size of the imaginary part are going to be the same. And so that's a complex number, R times 1 minus J. And we know 1 minus J has a magnitude root 2 and an angle minus 45 degrees. So we can write it in this, this term. So the current then is determined by uh, the magnitude of the impedance and the angle of the impedance. And we can tabulate that for different frequencies and different ranges. When the current is small, when it's very much less than the corner frequency, then this term, the imaginary part of the impedance, is going to dominate things, and you're going to, and that's going to be omega small in the denominator, and it's going to make one over omega c big. So the magnitude will just be uh, uh, omega c. Uh, excuse me, one over omega c. Yeah, when that's when omega is small, then uh, one over omega c is big. And that's going to be bigger than R, and that's going to dominate the impedance. So impedance is going to be big and be omega C in size and going to have an angle of uh, 90 degrees uh, minus the angle. So when we get our current out over here, uh, 
we put in a, 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 a amplitude V and we get out an amplitude omega CV and that's small because the impedance was big. Omega C was uh, uh, bigger than R and so, but then you're, uh, it's still a small number because omega is small. And we also get this angle of 90 degrees. The impedance is one over omega C and, and the impedance there would be um, big. And then you have one over the impedance here. Let me try and tell this again. The impedance is minus J over omega C and omega is small. So the imaginary part there is big. Minus one over omega C is big. And when you take that into the denominator, you get omega C, which is small. But it's still controlling relative to R. The angle would be minus 90 degrees here, so you get plus 90 degrees for minus the angle of Z. And so when you put that into the current, you get omega times CV growing linearly from a small value of omega as omega increases. It's going to increase proportionate to omega, and the angles would be 90 degrees. At the other end, or in the middle, when, uh, the, uh, when omega equals uh, 1 over RC, that's when you get Z is R minus JR. So then the magnitude there is root 2 r, so 1 over mag z is 1 over r root 2, and the angle there of the z is minus 45 degrees, so the angle of minus z is 45 degrees, or the angle of 1 over z is 45 degrees, and so you get the current is v divided by r root 2 times the cosine of omega ct, and then it's got an angle now of 45 degrees. So the current is uh, leading the, the voltage by 45 degrees now. And then as you go to really high frequencies, now omega C is big, one over omega C is small, the resistance dominates the impedance. And so one over Z is, uh, should be one over R, found a bug, and the angle of that's gonna be zero. So the current is just gonna be V divided by R times the cosine of omega T. It's gonna be in phase, and it's gonna uh, just have a constant amplitude there. If, if the amplitude of V is constant, then the current coming out is gonna be constant. So when we look at the voltages that go along with this, the uh, resistor voltage is gonna be R times I. So there's, it's gonna look exactly like the current, but the capacitor voltage is gonna be basically the integral of the current, right? So, uh, or we can just say we're going to multiply the, uh, uh, again, by the impedance of the capacitor. And again, we use magnitude and angle. So whatever our current was, we add, we multiply by magnitude Z of C at that frequency. And then we uh, add in the angle of Z of C at that frequency. So that means whatever the current was, we divide its amplitude by one over omega C, and we subtract 90 degrees from its angle because the angle of the capacitor uh, impedance is uh, not minus 90 degrees always. So now we can look when the frequency is small, the impedance again is dominated by the capacitor, and the voltage is going to be omega RC because uh, uh, we have the omega C uh, uh, from the impedance there, this in the so the, then we multiply the uh, current by R to get the resistor voltage. So the resistor voltage is omega RCV. That's proportional to omega growing with omega, and it's got an angle of 90 degrees relative to the, the voltage input. The capacitor voltage, since all the voltage is showing up across the capacitor because the capacitance is big there, is just going to be. Uh, um, going to multiply, uh, divide this current with the omega C in the numerator by omega C in the denominator to get back to the constant amplitude V. When we look at the corner frequency, where the impedance of the uh, series uh, RC is R minus JR, then we again uh, have V over root 2, so the amplitude is uh, root 2 smaller than the input, uh, and then the angle is now 45 degrees. Again, this is just the current multiplied by R, if you look at the current on the previous slide. On the capacitor, we take the current on the previous slide and divide it by omega C, and again we get back to uh, uh, the same term, V over root 2. And then, so the amplitude of the capacitor voltage and the amplitude of the uh, resistor voltage are the same, and they're 90 degrees out of phase with each other. The, the resistor is leading the... Uh, input by 45 degrees and the capacitor is trailing the input by 45 degrees. Finally at very high frequencies the impedance looks like R and so all the resistance shows up across the uh, 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 the resistor, all the re excuse me, all the voltage shows up across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor gets smaller and smaller with increasing frequency and it has a phase angle of minus 90 degrees.
So when we go back and look at these uh, low-pass filter plot, uh, the, this is the voltage across the capacitor in this circuit. We can see back here is the regime, regime where the capacitor is big and all the voltage showing up across the capacitor. Uh, in high frequencies, the voltage rolls off on the capacitor because it's getting smaller. It, the, the size of 1 over J omega C is getting smaller and smaller. While that's happening over here, when the uh, voltage is, is across the uh, capacitor, most of it, as the frequency increases, the current increases and more voltage shows up across the resistor. And it, the corner frequency, the amplitude of the two voltages is the same. One's got a lag of minus 45 degrees. The other's got a lead of 45 degrees. Uh, and you can, in fact, look at this and see these two curves are always 90 degrees apart. So the voltage and current, uh, the, the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor are just always 90 degrees apart because of the J in the denominator of the capacitor. So we can think about these frequency response shapes in terms of what's going on in the circuit. So now let's do that for the RLC circuit. So here's a series RLC circuit. <clears throat> uh, we know that the impedance of the, uh, well, first let's just do it from a, a, a sort of transfer function point of view. Uh, the transfer function, look at the output across the uh, uh, resistor now. We'll come back later to, uh, in uh, uh, next week to talk about the uh, output across the inductor and across capacitor, but here's the output across the resistor. So it's just R over SL plus R plus 1 over SC. We go through the usual uh, uh, mathematics to clean up those and uh, get uh, leading terms of 1 and the like. And so in the middle term here, we have uh, S times R over L over S squared plus S times R over L plus 1 over LC. That's the usual way we've looked at this. But we've also had this other way of thinking about this where we take it in terms of abstract quantities, uh, one called the undamped natural frequency, which is uh, uh, 1 over LC is the undamped natural frequency squared, omega 0 squared. And then we call this term uh, uh, the coefficient of S. We call that 2 zeta omega naught S where zeta is called the, uh, the damping ratio. Uh, and previously we'd have used two alpha there, but we, uh, zeta is a, a we can, Z, alpha gives us back, the roots come back in terms of alpha, but alpha is not really a parameter we can play with. The zeta lets us parameterize things very nicely. That's the reason we want to use zeta. So here's the magnitude and phase of those uh, of that expression you had on the previous page here, hr of j omega, where we plugged in j omega for s here, and you can see what's going to happen. The numerator is going to be 2j uh, s, 2j omega zeta omega naught. The denominator is going to be minus omega naught plus omega naught, minus, o, minus omega squared plus omega naught squared, and then plus 2j omega zeta omega naught. So when we plot the magnitude and phase of those expressions, normalizing the frequency by omega zero now instead of alpha, and letting zeta be a parameter, we see we get a bunch of curves here, and as zeta is decreasing, uh, so the first curve is zeta is 0.1, the second is zeta 0.05, these are decreasing by a factor of two every time, we see that the selectivity of this is a frequency selective filter. It's fairly narrow. This is on a linear scale from zero to two. Uh, so this is just twice the uh, undamped natural frequency. But you see that most of the frequency selectivity is over this range. Uh, and we'll come back and talk about what determines this range here. And as we make the zeta smaller, we get peakier, narrower, tighter, more frequency selective filter. We also see how the phase angle of this works. We get a phase angle of, uh, of minus 90 degrees uh, excuse me, plus 90 degrees over here at very low frequencies. And again, this is the voltage across the resistor relative to the input voltage. And then as we go to the uh, undamped natural frequency, we get no phase shift. So the signal is in phase with the output. The output's in phase with the input. And then as we increase frequency more, we see uh, 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 the phase continues to decrease and goes to minus 90 degrees. We can also do this for zeta bigger than one. So uh, um, here's uh, the blue curve in the uh, upper panel on the right. Uh, this is the frequency response. This is a Bode plot on this side. And you can see that for uh, zeta bigger than one, uh, I mean, it just comes up and it's got this broad characteristic to it. It doesn't have the kind of frequency selectivity that uh, it did uh, in the more uh, cases over here where zeta was a small number. And we can increase zeta. Uh, it's not going up by any particular factor. There's reasons for choosing these numbers. Uh, they make the... Uh, Zeta equals 1 has a pole at minus 1. Uh, Zeta equals 2.6 has a pole at uh, uh, 
uh, five and, and at, at minus five and minus 0.2, etc. So there's reasons for picking these poles, uh, these uh, values of zeta. They put the poles at nice numbers. Um, you can also see again that the angle uh, decreases from plus 90 degrees to minus 90 de uh, minus 90 degrees, going through zero degrees when the uh, frequency uh, this this should say omega over omega zero when the frequency is equal to the undamped natural frequency here, and um, you can see that the way it does it sort of changes shape. So as zeta gets bigger and bigger, this starts to look more like a low passy kind of angle curve uh, going from 90 down to zero, going through 45 degrees, and then continuing with an uh, excuse me a high passy kind of curve. And this is sort of a low passy kind of uh, angle curve going from zero down to minus 90 degrees. So we'll talk more about that also in a future uh, uh, session. So let's go back to our circuit and talk about um, the impedance of the circuit now, which is SL plus R plus 1 over SC. And when we put a cosine in over here on the input side, then the impedance as a function of omega is a Z of J omega, and the real part is R, and the imaginary part is omega L minus 1 over omega C. So you can see how you're going to get some of the same kind of properties here. When omega is small, the capacitor is going to dominate the impedance of the circuit, and most of the voltages will show up across the capacitor, and uh, some across the resistor, and then uh, even less across the inductor. When omega is big, then more of the voltage will show up across the inductor, and uh, less across the capacitor, and less across the resistor, and somewhere in between, omega and uh, the capacitor and the inductor are going to cause this term to cancel out. The frequency is going to be such that the capacitor and the inductor uh, cancel each other out and we just left with the impedance R. So the current again is v, uh, divide by the magnitude of J, uh, Z of J omega and uh, ne decrease the phase angle by the angle of Z of J omega uh, because normally we'd be going from the voltage to the current through an admittance and the impedance is 1 over the admittance. So for low frequencies, like we're saying, the capacitance dominates the impedance. So the impedance is approximately minus J over omega C. So the output, the current in response to a voltage over here is going to be proportional to omega C. It's going to be small when uh, omega is uh, uh, small. And it's going to have an angle of uh, plus 90 degrees because the capacitance had an angle of min minus 90 degrees. Uh, uh, so the current's going to grow linearly, and the phase is going to uh, the current phase is going to lead the voltage phase by 90 degrees. On the other end of the story, when we have high frequencies, now the impedance of the uh, inductor is the biggest of these three terms. So now we're going to get uh, that the amplitudes are going to the amplitude of the current is going to decrease with increasing omega, uh, and the phase angle is going to be minus 90 degrees. It's going to lag the current. It's going to lag the voltage because the voltage across the inductor it leads the current, so and it's dominating. So the current amplitude is going to decrease like 1 over omega, and the phase of the uh, current through the, all three elements is going to lag by uh, 90 degrees. And when we reach the... Un uh, it turns out that the frequency that makes uh, uh, the imaginary part of the impedance vanish is when it's omega is uh, root 1 over LC. That's the undamped natural frequency we had in our parameterization earlier. So when the um, imaginary part of the impedance vanishes, then there's no phase angle, and the, resist the impedance is just the resistance R, so the current is V over R uh, times the cosine omega naught T. And the input current would be, uh, the input voltage would be at frequency omega naught two there. I mean, that's what we're doing there. We're picking that voltage, that current, that frequency through the input voltage, uh, so that we uh, get no net uh, uh, imaginary part on the impedance. That's when the current's going to be biggest. All the other currents have been uh, smaller than that. And that's when the current is in phase with the voltage. So there's also going to be a place where the real and imaginary parts of the impedance are the same in size. And that's just a matter of uh, shoving some symbols around and solving for omega and find out where that makes, makes that happen. So when does omega L minus 1 over omega C equal either plus or minus R? Well, we go through and uh, uh, multiply through by uh, omega C, <clears throat> and then we uh, take uh, omega RC to the other side, and that's a quadratic on omega, and the roots of that quadratic are plus or minus, uh, uh, plus or minus coming from our minus plus in our equation here, R over 2L, and then plus or minus square root of R over 2L squared plus 1 over LC. But this 
term in the quadratic is always bigger than r over 2l, and we're interested in uh, positive values of omega for this to make sense. So the two corner frequencies are uh, the one that's to the left of omega 0 is uh, the term under the radical minus r over 2l, and the one to the right is a term under the radical plus r over 2l. And again, this is just shoving symbols around to get an answer. There's not a lot of insight here. Uh, it just it's just this is what these work out to. So now we can look at a table of uh, uh, currents versus different frequency regimes. Uh, we have five regimes now. When the uh, input frequency is very much less than the first corner frequency, uh, then the capacitor dominates. The impedance is 1 over j omega c, and the current uh, through the capacitor is v times omega c, and the angle there uh, times the cosine uh, with the angle of plus 90 degrees. So the, uh, the, current, the current is leading the voltage there. On the other end of that, when the in an inductor is dominating, uh, then we get V over omega L times cosine omega T minus 90 degrees. So very high frequencies. Again, we saw for low frequencies that the current will grow. For high frequencies, the current will decrease with increasing frequency. Uh, in the middle, at the uh, uh, undamped natural frequency, we just get V over R times cos omega naught T. So this is V over R is the, the scale factor of cos omega naught T. Omega, cos omega naught t is not in the denominator in any of these. The v over r term is the amplitude. And at the two corner frequencies, then the amplitude is down relative to what it is at the undamped natural frequency by root 2. And it leads at the lower frequency corner frequency uh, by 45 degrees, and it lags by minus 45 degrees. So when we look at the outputs, all these outputs I mean, have to be proportional in some sense, in, in, in an impedance sense, uh, whether we're looking at the voltage across the inductor or the resistor or the capacitor, they all have the same current going through them, so we can get them all back from the current, and we have the expression for the current in terms of the impedance, so we use the magnitude of the impedance of the inductor with an added phase of 90 degrees, we use the impedance of the resistor, there's no phase increase there, and we use the impedance of the capacitor with a a, neg a decrease of the phase by 90 degrees to get that. And we're just going to look at the resistor voltage now, but you can see how we can come back and look and how we'll have some interactions of this thing is decreasing with frequency omega, this is growing, or, or this is growing with frequency omega, and now it's growing again with omega. So maybe the capa maybe the voltage across the inductor looks like uh, grows like omega squared. Uh, this was de this was uh, the current was increasing. Uh, um, with a rate omega c in low frequencies, and here the impedance of the capacitor is omega c, so maybe the voltage across the uh, capacitor is constant at low frequencies, constant amplitude. And then this uh, resistor voltage should look like the current curve. So here we are back to the resistor voltage, and now we see, uh, again, uh, that it goes to a maximum value of 1 at the undamped natural frequency, uh, where the resistance of the, where the impedance had an impedance r. So we just had uh, every, all the voltage was showing up across the resistor because there was nothing uh, in the in the sum of the voltage across the uh, capacitor and the voltage across the inductor to take away any of the voltage. They were out of phase with each other and they add up to nothing and all the voltage across the resistor. Uh, and the, the total impedance of the circuit seen by the voltage source, uh, it just sees the resistance R. Uh, and so the current... Uh, is uh, just V over R, and then you go back through the resistor R, and you get V back. Uh, same whether you're doing this with uh, large values of zeta or small values of zeta, it always goes to a maximum value of one. And we'll talk about again. We know that at these, uh, the, the, when we'll come back and talk about what values make this 0.707 in just a minute. And that's right now. So the corner frequencies are the half power frequencies. Remember when the amplitude is down by one over root two, uh, the gain is down by a half. And so we call that the half power bandwidth, the distance between those two corner frequencies. And when you do that, the two radical terms, there's a missing closed paren over here, but when you do that, the two radical terms go away and you just get that that bandwidth is R over two L or two zeta omega naught. Well, people have been doing this for a long time and uh, they liked big numbers instead of small numbers, apparently. So there was a, a there's there's other ways to define this quality factor Q. Uh, it's the undamped natural frequency divided by that half power bandwidth, or that's one over two zeta. So when zeta is small, the quality factor is going to be big, 
And that's going to be a narrow circuit, narrow band circuit. We call that a tuned circuit because it's tuned around a particular value. It's called a resonant circuit because the circuit you can be shown, you can say that it resonates with that frequency, that it responds well to that frequency and not to others. It shakes at the frequency you're driving at, so to speak. And that's the case when things are very underdamped. Uh, there's ways to talk about this in terms of how much energy builds up in the, the stored energy in the inductor and the capacitor relative to how much energy, energy you're dissipating uh, in the uh, resistor. And that's, uh, that's the, the nature of the quality, the another one, nature of the way to describe the quality factor. When the quality factor is very much less than one or when zeta is very much greater than one, then you have these wideband and overdamped uh, characteristics again. So here's just one of these uh, underdamped curves. And we can see now that this is the one where the zeta was 0.1. So the corner frequency actually turns out to be very well approximated by um, uh, undamped free natural frequency minus 0.1, minus a, a zeta omega naught, and here's the uh, plus zeta omega naught. So here's two zeta omega naught as the bandwidth of that filter. Uh, you can also see that the phase angle goes from plus 45 degrees to minus 45 degrees as you go from uh, uh, the, corner fre one, the lower frequency corner frequency to the higher frequency corner frequency. So in summary, uh, we explore the behavior of first and second order circuits by examining how the impedance determine the current and then how the element impedance determine the voltage back out. Uh, we introduce the idea of bandwidth, uh, uh, we, which is two zeta omega naught, and the quality factor Q, which is uh, one over two zeta. So that's sort of a normalized bandwidth uh, inverted there. What we're gonna do next uh, uh, is called the vector interpretation of frequency response. Today we're talking about how do you get the frequency response out of circuits now we're going to talk about what is it about the circuit's poles and zeros that determine the shape of the frequency response. Because that's a way, we again, you start to abstract things away from just having the physical circuit in front of you. You have the pole zero diagram. You can tell what the frequency response is going to look like. And you don't have to know whether the poles or zeros came from capacitors and resistors or capacitors and inductors or resistors and inductors or from some op-amp circuit. And the next, after that, we'll do uh, what's called Bode's method, uh, uh, which is a way of looking at the pole zero diagram and drawing the frequency response uh, as a Bode plot uh, without having to do, without having to, you know, use computers or anything. It's because you know what's going on and you know how to, you know what each pole and each zero means. So this has been uh, EE300 Linear Circuit Analysis 2, Module 3, Video 4, Resonant Circuits.